did you know that you can save yourself from those intrusive thoughts that drive you crazy? Those thoughts that make you feel like you just like, ah, I just want to empty my head. Those intrusive thoughts are actually your new best friend. And why I'm saying that is because the way that you save yourself from your thoughts is by seeing those thoughts as your new best friend, because those thoughts contain so much information that will empower you to get control. So instead of seeing them as something to like, oh, they're bad, I must get rid of them, I can't handle them, to look at them and say, okay, those intrusive thoughts are telling me something. What are they telling me? So they're your new best friend because they're going to help you get through whatever it is that you need to get through. And you will be amazed when you shift your perspective like this. It's not going to be, I've got to control my thoughts. I've got to speak, think positive thoughts. I've got to, it's actually, I've got to get rid of those intrusive thoughts. Those intrusive thoughts are driving me crazy. You can actually say, yeah, they are driving me crazy, but I'm the only one who can save myself from those thoughts. And the way I do that is by seeing them as my new best friend so, because they can help me. So in this podcast today, I'm going to talk to you about how you can save yourself from those thoughts, those intrusive thoughts that drive you crazy, and what it means to look at those intrusive thoughts as your new best friend. I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf, your host, and welcome to Cleaning Up the Mental Mess. And today's mess we cleaning up is how to manage intrusive thoughts. And only you can save yourself from those thoughts. But just before we begin, if you haven't yet joined my New Year's Challenge, which we do every year for 63 days, because that's the time it takes to rewire your, the networks in your brain, to rewire those intrusive thoughts. And I really encourage you to join us. You can actually get 20% discount off the, the uh, subscription to the web app. And you can jump on at any point. The link and the details to join the challenge are in the show notes. I do weekly webinars through the app to help answer your questions and guide you through the process. I'm doing a 63 day with you. I'll be doing it with you. And you can jump on at any time and join us. So I hope you'll join us there. Also, if you like watching, instead of just listening, you can head over to YouTube and you can find this podcast at Dr. Dr. Caroline Leaf. And let's dive into the how to manage intrusive thoughts. When we develop, and I'm going to read this to you, I am the only one who can help myself deal with my thoughts. This mindset is life-saving. That's one of those boom mic drop moments when you realize that. I don't know how many times I have gone to my husband who's so patient and talks through all these thoughts and he'll say something to me like, he'll listen and talk and help me reconceptualize and literally do a neurocycle with me. And then I'll carry on about the same thing again. And he'll say like, he'll remind me, you, I can't get those thoughts out your head. You have to do something about them. There's the, we've discussed this. Those are your best friend. You always say that. You are the one who's going to have to deal with those thoughts. And so that the point I'm making here is that you can sit with your loved ones, your therapists, your coaches, your counselors, your, you can, with whoever will listen to you and you can try and get those thoughts out of your head. And or you can try and get, use the other people to get those thoughts out of your head, but you are actually the only one that can save yourself from those thoughts. And you know, you and I both know that when you don't manage those intrusive thoughts, they can be incapacitating. They can make you feel like shocking and you go round and round in circles and can tie you down and tie you up in knots and really, you know, cripple how you function in a day. So it's really important that you recognize that only you can save yourself from your intrusive thoughts. So the first thing to do that is to recognize, no, maybe that's the right, that's not the right word, but is to shift your understanding of an intrusive thought as this bad thing to something that's actually your best friend. Now think of your best friend, your best friend that you have great time with, that encourages you and motivates you, but also tells you when there's something that's kind of off in your life or, you know, gives you advice. So maybe you, you know, shouldn't do that or points out things that are, Maybe not so great that you're doing or saying or that you've maybe hurt them or whatever. A best friend can be honest with, we can be honest with our best friends. And that is how you want to handle this. You want to see that intrusive thought as your best friend. And the reason I say that is because your non-conscious mind that you've heard me talk about plenty of times, and if you haven't, your mind has a conscious part, which is awake when you're awake, and a non-conscious part, which is awake 24-7, which is the most intelligent part of you, it's where Everything you're exposed to that you're aware of or not is mm. stored and that is constantly searching for what you need to get rid of and what you need to 
build on that's good for you and send signals through the subconscious into your conscious mind to help you do that. Now, I've written more about that in my books. I explain it in the app as well. There's podcasts on it. So essentially, your intrusive thoughts are inside the non-conscious mind and the non-conscious mind is uh, is basically scanning and think of those thoughts looking like trees. So for, uh, for those of you that are listening, I'm holding up a little green plant. Think of every single thought, whether it's a thoughts whether intrusive thought can be good and bad you can have a good thought that's popping up that's intrusive Mm -hmm. and that one it's good for you and you want to pay attention and focus on it and you know take all the great feelings that you get from that but if it's a toxic intrusive thought that's popping up you definitely want to do something about that by seeing it as your new best friend so your non-conscious mind finds those thoughts that are either going to enhance or optimize and help you function in a more resilient way, find more peace, happiness, all that stuff, and prompt you, and then you want to pay attention to them. And they also find the ones that are disruptive, so intrusive thoughts that are patterns of thinking, that are networks that are driving you in the wrong direction, affecting maybe your your work life, your relationships, your how you see things, how you do things, how you are coping, your coping strategies, all that kind of thing. Thoughts will also become intrusive until you actually learn to sit with them. So then they're not going anywhere. So you can drink them away, drug them away, exercise them away. They're not going away. They are going to come back. So instead of trying to fight them, embrace them. See them as your new best friend. See them as giving you information. Now, thoughts are filled with information, and that information is data. And scientifically, that information is what we call memories. So memories are the data that form the thought. And so by being your new best friend, think of how your best friend, as I already said, gives you feedback, gives you information. You share ideas back and forth. So it's information that's being shared and that's those, that information is, is, is data. It's memories. So when a thought pops up, that's your non-conscious mind pushing it into the conscious mind to make you aware of the details, the data, the memories of that thought. And if we look at the structure of a tree, as I've often explained, the branches are how you interpret the experience, which is the roots. So the thought has roots and branches. The roots are the initial experience, and then how you interpret that experience based on who you are, how you think, what you've gone through, are the branches. And then that collectively influences, is what that's what's driving you, okay? So when it is a driver that is not a healthy driver, then it is your non-conscious mind finds that, and then pushes it into your conscious mind through your subconscious mind to grab your attention. So that intrusive thought will come up and generally your first impression of an intrusive thought is you're going to have an emotion and you're going to have a sensation in your body. It's going to be pretty quick. You're going to have a flash of a perspective through your mind and you may be going to have a little bit of an awareness of your behaviors. You may not get all of that. What you'll definitely get in the initial rush is the emotion and and the sort of perspective that's attached, kind of the attitude that's attached to the thought and then the bodily sensation. Sometimes it takes a little longer to, to see the behaviors associated with that intrusive thought. So those are signals, so the emotions and how your body feels and, and, and perspective, attitude, those are signals to, to, that are saying to you, pay attention, because if you imagine that those signals, and for those of you that are listening, I'm holding up the plant again, I want you to imagine that there's four strings attached to this plant. And at the end of those four strings, there's four balloons. And those four balloons are emotions, behaviors, perspectives, and bodily sensation. The behavior one may not be as in your face. It may be a bit smaller because it's not always so easy to see your behaviors as a thought pops up. But the others like are hitting you in the face. It's kind of see that analogy. And But they, the key thing here is they attach by strings. This is just an analogy to these. It, it's an analogy for what's actually happening on an energetic level inside the brain. So when you consciously focus on those those sensation those signals, then this it pulls the thought into your conscious mind. So there it was. I focus on them and I pull it into my conscious mind. So I'm holding it under the table. You can't see it, and now you can see it. So when I do that and I see this as my new best friend, I can look at that tree and I can see. Okay, now let me analyze in more detail these. The detail, the data, the emotions, what's going on here? Why is this intrusive? Why does it make me feel like that? Where's that feeling coming from? How often? Where? What are the behaviors? Now you can go into the behaviors. What are the other emotions? What, what's going on here? What is the self-talk? What is, what is this? What are the details here? What is this data? 
And then where does it come from? Go to the roots. And, and how, how, where does that, and as you do that, you're pulling it apart. You, on a neuroscientific level, you're like pulling the leaves and the branches apart and you kind of, like really weakening it and you're going down and digging the sand out and taking it out the pot and you're looking at the roots and you can never eliminate this, but you are de- deconstructing it. And then you can see, oh, that root's a little kind of rotten there. That was like a bit of a bad experience. No wonder that branch over there is like kind of a toxic looking reaction and why I'm saying that and, you know, why this is intrusive. It's like this, this is something I need to deal with. And this is what I need to deal with. This is where it's coming from. Okay, so now how can I deal with this? Let's say you have a, an intrusive thought that maybe you're doing, you're doing a PhD or a master's or studying something and you're having an intrusive thought that I am uh, imposter syndrome, very common imposter syndrome for all kinds of situations. So let's say it's an imposter syndrome thought. So that's the name of the thought. But now that's popping up, so you're an imposter. This is not really you. You shouldn't be saying those things. Why do you think you can, you know, all those kinds of thoughts. So it's popping up. So instead of it, instead of it just popping up and popping up and making you feel worse and worse and you're trying to sh- shove it down or whatever, drink it away or whatever, you stop and you say, okay, you my new best friend, what are you telling me? What is this imposter syndrome? What is the detail? What am I actually saying to myself? What are the details of this imposter syndrome? I don't think I'm good enough. Why do I even think I can say that? I don't know enough. I could never th- think about this myself. Oh, this is such nonsense. They're all going to think I'm stupid. Wow, you start looking at that. And while you are seeing all that detail, there's the emotions and anxiety and the frustration and your body's maybe got electric shocks going through it and your perspective is, it sucks, I can never do this, I'm not good enough, why am I wasting my time, who am I kidding? You know, that would be a perspective. So you see that and say, okay, that's the reality, I acknowledge that, but now where's this coming from? Is it that I, is that someone said something to me? Someone said a few things to me that have made me feel like I'm stupid or I'm not good enough? Is that the truth though? Is that fair that they said that? Is it, if they've made, if I'm feeling like I can't do something because that person's made me feel bad about myself, what are they saying? Maybe they've got the issue. Maybe, maybe it's, you know, it's, it's, it's them with the issue. Or maybe that's just a harsh way of them saying that I could improve. And if I really listen to what they're saying, maybe what they're saying, if I get beyond the sort of emotional impact, they actually saying, well, why don't you try it this way? Or, Maybe if you look at it this way, and so it's not actually someone telling you that you're not good enough, it's someone trying to help you get better or whatever. This process is you saving yourself. It's you going and finding the truth. And in that process, you've deconstructed, you've put healing, like plant food on the, on the plants. In, in my book, How to Help Your Child Clean Up Their Mental Mess, I actually use the analogy of going and putting plant food on in this process that I'm describing now. So this process I'm describing now is really simply put in this book, How to Help Your Child Clean Up Their Mental Mess. We find a lot of adults love this book. And there's a whole Brainy Bundle discount on that book with the little character Brainy and the coloring book. At the moment, it's called the Brainy Bundle. This is the character that's a cartoon throughout the book, which you've made into a toy. So if you're interested in getting this for your children or to get it to help help yourself, you can just go to drleaf.com and there are all kinds of discounts on the Brainy Bundle. But coming back to this, you are actually saving yourself by deconstructing and reconstructing the sort. You're putting this plant food on and you're reconstructing it into where, okay, so it's valid to have imposter syndrome because it's motivating me to learn more. So that person who made me feel like I'm dumb, well, maybe they did it out of good intentions or maybe they were just being nasty because they've got imposter syndrome. Either way, let me learn from it. Maybe there's something more I need to read so I feel more confident about explaining that concept or something like that. So I can reconstruct that and help that that intrusive thought now turn into something healthy. Wouldn't have looked nice and healthy and green initially. It would have been all toxic, but I've made it into something healthy. I'm the only one who can do that. I can have 10 professors come to me and tell me how fantastic what my scientific discovery is or what I'm writing in that paper if I'm a PhD student or what I'm doing at work is, is, is great. But that at the back of my mind, that one person saying that thing is niggling at me, is making me feel, just being in their presence is making me feel stupid or insecure, or whatever. I'm, it doesn't matter how many people come and say that's not the truth. Until you've done this process of gathering awareness, reflecting, maybe write this down, seeing it differently, 
looking at it from a different perspective, reconceptualizing in other words, and then getting down to the point where you find, okay, this is the source, and then deciding, okay, well, what are my steps? What am I going to do to change this? How can I, I'm, I'm going to actually now implement that next time they have this grumpy face in that meeting and they say that comment, I'm going to go beyond the grumpy face and I'm going to hear the comment and I'm going to see, is this good information? Could I use this and get better at what I'm doing? Is this going to help me? If it's not, I can just discard this and let them have their bad day and I don't have to take the... So I can do that. That's my action. So I have a plan in place. And next time I go in the meeting and they say something that makes me feel like I've got imposter syndrome, I have a plan. I can draw on this. I've done the work. This is what pops up into my conscious mind. This is what I work from. So only you can create those and only you can save yourself. So intrusive thoughts are you or your new best friend and you're the only one who can save yourself from those intrusive thoughts. So when you do that, you are being a couple of things. This is you being honest and vulnerable and authentic with yourself. Sometimes we're not honest, vulnerable and authentic enough with ourselves. It looks like you're facing your pain. It looks like um, it looks like being able to sit with the pain and the fear and the terror and the frustration or whatever ever other emotions that dredges, dredges up, literally dredges up, sorry. I mean dredges, not dredges. It looks like seeing the behaviors associated with these emotions and how these, these have impacted yourself and your functioning and your relationships and your coping mechanisms. It looks like seeing how this has messed or shifted with your perspectives. It looks like how this has affected your body and your health. It looks like deeply reflecting on why and finding the source. It looks like deconstructing and most importantly, reconstructing the reasons behind why this is a pattern in your life. It looks like acceptance of what has happened and a decision to reconceptualize and move forward. It looks like you're deciding how you want your life to play out into your future despite what has happened. It looks like reaching out to others by owning the impact of your choice, your choices have had on their lives, not just you. It looks like reaching out to others to walk alongside you and to not fix you. This is how you can save yourself. And doing all of that that I've just explained and read, the neurocycle is how you do it. I've pretty much just done a neurocycle. And the neurocycle is what you do to help align your mind-brain-body connection and manage your mind. So I encourage you, if you're not already using the neurocycle guides, use it. It works. It to, to When you learn how to realize that only you could save yourself from your thoughts and that those thoughts, when you see them as your new best friend, it is life-changing. That incapacitating, if only could have, would have, should have way of functioning that can jam you and lock you up and make you just feel awful and that will play out in your physical body and in your mental health. That doesn't have to be the life that you live. You can move beyond that. So I really hope you apply this. I really hope that you can use this. Share your feedback, add a comment. I look forward to seeing you next time. And if you've liked this podcast, enjoyed this podcast, please like, share, subscribe, do all those things you're supposed to do, put a five-star review and join me next week for some more tips on how to manage your mind. Thanks so much.